knows the current phase of the moon? I see very few hands. It's a waxing crescent moon. Who knows if you stood on the shores of the San Francisco Bay, how many high tides you would notice in a 24-hour period? That's good, two high tides. How many low tides? Trick question, two as well. When you're entering the Duke Chapel through the front, what direction are you facing? Not east, mostly to the west and slightly north. And now here's the hardest question of all. What time did the sun rise this morning? 6.25. If you didn't get any of those questions right, it may be that you're a little more connected to the smartphone than you are to the natural world. Several years ago, I taught a course, a freshman seminar that was entitled Ancient and Modern Perceptions of Our Natural World. And on class, that very first morning, I asked those students many of these same questions. They fared poorly. But one student gave the perfect answer to the question as to when the sun rose. Her answer, way, way before I did. <laughs> that is totally full credit in my books. You know, but not everyone gets up too late to observe the sunrise. In fact, through the millennium, there have been keen observationalists who've made very careful studies of the Earth, and those have totally overturned our understanding of the natural world. I'm sure you're very familiar with Galileo, whose careful observation of four moons rotating around Jupiter shattered the current understanding at the time that all heavenly bodies rotated around the Earth. You may not know, but you should know Nicholas Steno. Nicholas Steno is a Danish anatomist who worked at the Medici Court in Florence. And he was interested in many things about the natural world. And one thing that he was very curious about was the origin of very small stones that were embedded in the granite that was scattered around the Tuscan hillside. The locals called these small stones tongue stones. One day, Steno was called to the public square to dissect the head of a great white shark that had been captured offshore by local fishermen. When that great white shark was brought in and Steno looked at the great gaping jaws of that shark, he realized that those stones embedded in the granite, those tongue stones, were nothing more or nothing less than shark's teeth. And with that recognition, he understood that that granite and the Tuscan hillside was once sediment at the ocean floor collecting the rain of shark's teeth. Steno's estimate then of the time it takes for ocean sediment to become continental rock shattered the current estimate then that the earth was simply a few thousand years old. Here's my personal favorite, Count Rumford. I'm going to take you back to 1751 when a British sea captain was transiting the Atlantic in what's called the Torrid Zone. This British sea captain and his crew, armed with just a simple wooden bucket, a very, very long rope, and a thermometer of Mr. Fahrenheit's, measured the temperatures of the ocean from the surface all the way down to 1,500 meters depth. And what they found, not surprisingly, was that the surface temperatures were very warm, but that the, as they went further and further down, the temperature became very, very cold. Now, these measurements were not all that interesting from a scientific basis to the captain and the crew, but they did write in their letter to the Royal Society that they were very happy to have found a means to supply their baths and wine with cold water. Those measurements were very interesting to Count Rumford, who came upon this letter nearly 50 years later. And he found these measurements to be a scientific puzzle, and this is why. Those cold waters that recorded at depth were much colder than the air temperatures ever were in that tropical environment. Colder than they ever were at night, colder than they ever were at winter. And so from that single profile of temperature measurements, Count Rumford in 1800 deduced what we call today the ocean overturning circulation, popularly called the conveyor belt. He understood that those cold waters that fill the tropical oceans had to have had their origin at the surface waters in high latitude. During the winter, those surface waters at high latitudes lose their heat to the atmosphere. They cool, they become dense, and at, when they become dense, they overturn and sink, and they start spreading to distant parts of the globe. 
Those waters then in those distant parts of the globe upwell, they warm as they come back to the surface, and they return to their formation sites. That overturning circulation has large importance for our regional and global climate. It's the reason that Iceland is habitable and Greenland is barely so. It's the reason the British Isles are warm and wet compared to comparable latitudes in Canada. So we have had a long interest in the ocean overturning circulation because it moves heat. But today, we have another reason to be very interested in the overturning circulation, and this is a reason that's unimaginable, or would have been unimaginable to Count Rumford. And that's because today, after about 10 or 15 years of ocean measurements, we now understand that the deep ocean is a reservoir for the carbon dioxide that has been released into our atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution because of the burning of fossil fuels. Let me walk you through this plot that stands behind me. So imagine you are on an ocean research vessel and you're making a transit along the red line. So we're going to start in Iceland and go south down through the Atlantic. Then when we hit the Southern Ocean, we're going to go eastward. And then once we hit the South Pacific, we're going to go up until we hit the Aleutian Islands. Along the way, we're taking measurements of the concentration of the carbon dioxide in the water, and then we are plotting it here. So zero is the distance in Iceland. 30,000 kilometers later, the ship has reached the Aleutian Islands. And we're looking at the concentration of carbon dioxide from the surface to depth. Wherever you see red, those are high concentrations. Blue is low. We completely expected to see high concentrations of carbon dioxide at the ocean surface because that's where the water is in contact with the atmosphere. But what we also see there in the North Atlantic are concentrations of carbon dioxide produced by the burning of fossil fuel that are in the deep ocean. This is the overturning circulation alive and well, taking that atmospheric carbon dioxide, transporting it at depth because of the ocean overturning. This is good news, and it's also bad news. It's good news because that carbon dioxide is now in the ocean and not in the atmosphere where we know it has the potential to produce further warming. But it's bad news because increasing carbon dioxide concentration in the ocean means ocean acidification, which is an unhappy prospect for marine ecosystems. Oceanographers like me really want to know if the ocean will continue to be a carbon reservoir. And whether or not it will continue to be a reservoir depends strongly on something I study, which is how the overturning circulation will vary in time. When surface waters warm, they become less dense, so they're less prone to sinking. When ocean waters become fresher due to ice melt, whether that's from sea ice or glacier melt, they become less dense and they're less prone to sinking. We know that as global warming continues apace, surface waters become warmer and there will be more melting of ice. Our current assumption is that these changes will make the waters less prone to overturning and so our overturning circulation should slow down. We don't know for sure and we don't know by how much and we really don't know on what time scale. So my idea was to work with colleagues to go to the high latitudes of the North Atlantic where there is the overturning, put in an observing system, measure the strength of the overturning, and how it is responding to temperature and salinity changes. And so in the spring of 2009, I convened a workshop on Duke's campus and invited oceanographers from around the globe to move this idea forward. And from that workshop was born a program called OSNAP, overturning in the subpolar North Atlantic program. I'm glad you liked that. My 17-year-old son at the time named it, and I'm, he's, quite, he's quite proud of it. This program is taking measurements now from Labrador over to Greenland and from Greenland over to the Scottish Isles. Now, years ago, maybe a few decades ago, our only choice really to make these measurements would have been aboard a ship that moves slowly and methodically across the ocean with oceanographers on board, taking samples, bringing that water on board, and, and measuring and recording it um, at sea. Today, technology has provided us a means to measure the ocean in ways that were unimaginable to Rumford, certainly Steno, and certainly also um, to Galileo. 
Today we have gliders and floats, which are small autonomous vehicles that can be launched from small watercraft. They go on their merry way, measuring at the surface, measuring at depth, and then they come up to the surface periodically, relay their information to a satellite, to an oceanographer who could be sitting in a cozy coffee shop, and that data can be downloaded there on her laptop. For oceanographers who are prone to seasickness, like me, these are a godsend. So our observing system was put in place in 2014, just last summer. This is a US-led effort. There are seven countries involved, and I'm the international lead. Wherever you see a line here, that's where a ship has gone and has put a string of instruments that are currently in place. These are called moorings to measure the overturning circulation. And this is a, a section then from Labrador to Greenland to Scotland. And the colors are showing the salinity of the water. Red means high salinity waters, blue means low salinity waters. Wherever you see a hatched region, there's the areas that are being patrolled by gliders and also by floats. So this observing system will be in place five to 10 years. I fully expect that it will provide us uh, answers about the overturning circulation and how it is responding to climate changes, such as changes in the temperature of the water and the freshening um, of the waters as well. All of this has to do with Duke, because I am Duke. Whether I'm in a classroom, standing in front of a classroom at sea, or in front of you here this evening, Duke has afforded me fabulous opportunities. It has fostered my intellectual development and has also given me the opportunity to work with outstanding students and outstanding colleagues. As an oceanographer, I see a very strong link between the capital campaign and the ocean. Here's the link. The ocean is driven by energy, a prime source of which is the wind. Sustained periods of weak winds produce slack currents, low wave energy, and the depletion of nutrients at the surface. But when strong winds come arise, the ocean's surface is, is mixed, nutrients come to the surface, and blooms result. Strong winds create strong currents that carry heat and carbon to different places of the globe, and strong winds create large waves that propagate great distances. A capital campaign to a university is as wind to the ocean. Because the infusion of funds to a university that's filled with ideas and filled with vision can create currents that carry those ideas and vision forward. A campaign can create blooms locally, all the while carrying students, faculty, and programs to distant places around the globe. And a campaign can extend a faculty member's reach by aiding the propagation of an idea, a lecture, or an innovation. In essence, with a capital campaign, a university can gain some fluidity because it can go places it couldn't go before. So in closing, as an oceanographer, I would simply like to say that I have every expectation that the energy that comes from this campaign will produce for Duke a whole ocean of progress. Thank you.